Okay, now I want you to open your Bibles uh, to, uh, remember we're, we're looking at, the, at Matthew chapters 24 and, uh, and 25, <clears throat> and uh, I want us to continue through this uh, study until we get through these chapters, because uh, you may be like me, you're gonna, you, if you haven't already, you're going to you discover some people that you come in contact with that have questions about what's going on. Not just within our country and all this, but they, they question, well, how, you know, what's, what's happening here and what's the Lord doing? Is this got, does this have something to do with the Lord coming back and all these sorts of things? <clears throat> and uh, so uh, recently, in fact, uh, now it's happened more, uh, but just recently there's a fellow that I was talking to. And by the way, folks, this gives you a great, great chance to witness right now to tell people about the Lord. And so this, this uh, person was said, well, uh, I said, the Lord, you know, it's, it's all about the Lord coming back. And he said, I, be, I believe uh, that uh, something, he mentioned a place. He said, something has got to take place in, he mentioned a certain, it wasn't Jerusalem, a certain place. He said, before that happens, I said, no, sir. <laughs> I said, not before the rapture takes place. I said, a lot of things that people are looking forward to think that these things have to happen before Jesus comes. I said, that's after the rapture of the church, those things that they're talking about. I said, the, the thing is that the Lord could come at any moment, folks. And I, I, I just believe that he is. I really do. <clears throat> and so what I want to do is help us, first of all, to remember what our, think about our relationship to the Lord and think about those that we have that we need to be sharing Jesus with and think about those that we come in contact with. I want, I want our church uh, to have the, uh, the ammunition to let people know what's going on, okay? And so let's read these, these verses, <clears throat> and when, when I say what's going on, uh, I'm talking about the Lord coming back, and, and be, be uh, prepared to answer some questions that people have about, about uh, the return of the Lord. <clears throat> well, we're looking today at, at verses 15 through 20 of chapter 24 of Matthew. Jesus says, Therefore, when you see <clears throat> the abomination of desolation spoken of, by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. Whoever reads, let him understand. Hey, that's important. <laughs> Amen? We're going to talk about what that means to us this morning. He says in verse 16, let, He says, Then let those <clears throat> who, are in, who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Now, as you, as you read that, don't you get a, a, a sense of urgency there? That what Jesus is talking about, there's a, when you see something happen, when you, th when you see this abomination of desolation, there is an urgency there's an urgency there, and you can't, you, you can't take time to, you, you know, he talked about uh, pray that the, the ladies are, are not pregnant or are nursing babies and so forth because it's going to be difficult for them because of the way they have to flee. And also pray that it won't be on the Sabbath. Why? Because back at that time especially, places were closed down on the Sabbath, okay? And so you may have to have uh, 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 things for your journey. So pray that it's not like that. And so you say, well, how does this, how does this all apply to the, to the Lord uh, coming back? Well, folks, this, what we have to do, we have to look into this abomination of desolation. But I want to ask you this question. Now, the disciples of Jesus, uh, they, you know, they start off this, this, uh, this chapter in verse 3. It says, now, now as they sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. And some people say, well, you know, they had Jesus there with them, and, and they, they were wondering about all these future events and so forth. Are they not much different than folks today? We want to know about the future too, don't we? You know, people, I, pretty much everybody would like to know something about the future. And we know there's a lot of things about the future that we don't know. <laughs> right? We don't know, folks. I, I don't know what's going to happen to America. America's not really in the Bible as far as, especially end times, we don't know what's going to happen to America. Those kinds of things, we have speculation about what's going to happen. Some people think that we're going to end up joining the European Union, and there's all kinds of speculation about those kinds of things. Those questions we don't know. 
But we do know that Jesus is coming back. And we know there's going to be a, a time of trouble. <clears throat> In fact, Jesus' answer uh, to those uh, uh, disciples and, uh, and to us uh, is this Olivet Discourse. This is his answer. He goes into some detail about, about what they should look for and about what we should look for. And he points to a, to a time of great trouble for the Jews. You know, I, I think all of us would agree this morning <clears throat> that history has not been kind to the Jews. Now, we, go, we know that God has always taken care of them, but history really hasn't been very kind to the Jews. They're, the Jews are still a people that are hated around this world. As God's people, even, they're still hated around this world. Six million were killed by Adolf Hitler in what we know as the Holocaust by his, him and his evil regime. I don't know if you're familiar with the name uh, Elie Wiesel, but he was, a, <clears throat> uh, he was a Nobel Prize winning author, and uh, he was a Holocaust survivor. And so he pretty much spent, he died a few years ago, but he much, pretty much spent his whole life uh, writing about things about the Holocaust. And he wanted to keep that before people so people could understand what happened during that period of time. Because, oh, by the way, some people would like to just dismiss that. Some people would like to even deny that. Amen? But he said, probably the worst night and or day in his life was when he got to his, when he was in his first concentration camp. He said the first night that he was in his first concentration camp, he said he watched <clears throat> as his mother and sister were burned in the ovens. And he said that day, he said, for me, he said, I died inside. He said, my faith, he said, he said, he even mentions the word that God died for him. Because he could not understand all these things that were, that were going on. And so he wanted to keep that alive. We know that the Jews suffered terrible, terrible at that time. But guess what? There's another terrible day coming. There's another terrible day coming for the Jews and also for the whole world. Because you see, many and, and perhaps most times, whatever happens with the Jews affects the whole world. Amen? God's, he's got his hand on his people, and so uh, I've always heard, in fact, Cy Smith, his, his father-in-law, was a, a pastor, preacher, a director of missions, and he always told him, the young Cy Smith, can you imagine that? He always told the young Cy Smith, he said, now, now son, he said, if you, if you want to know about uh, the second coming, he said, watch Israel, and watch the Middle East. What's going on in the Middle East? That's going to have a lot to do with uh, when the Lord comes back, and of course, Cy did. I'm so... Uh, thrilled uh, with Cy. Two things. Well, I, I got to mention old Cy a little bit this morning. Uh, Cy, uh, uh, when I was with him, uh, I gained uh, two things for Cy. Mostly when I was with him, there's one thing that I that I, one thing I gained while I was with him. Another thing I gained after he was out of the ministry. When I was with him, I got I got his hand me downs. <laughs> He's all he was always giving me suits and sport coats and ties and just. And there were sometimes he would go to a sale where they where they were, they were uh, had a suit sale, and I'd go back. I had an office there at Red Star too. I staff evangelist, and he would walk in with a new suit and get, just go out and buy something for himself. He'd buy me a new suit. <clears throat> but then later, after he's out of the ministry, I inherited a lot of his books. <laughs> I would visit him, and he'd give he'd give me a bunch of books to take home. And it's, I'm always interested in, in watching and, and looking at some of the, some of the things that he underlined going through these books. And uh, it's, just, it's interesting because one book that I received from it just recently, I, I looked at it, opened it up, and there was, a, there was a piece of paper, just a little piece of paper, and it was old. And I was asking Phyllis, I said, when did Cy and Georgian move to Columbia? Because this, this was a tear out from the paper in Columbia. And, uh, and I thought, he, he, he marked that for some particular reason. So I'm digging in and finding out what he marked it for because I, I, you know, I uh, uh, respect him very, very much. But anyway... Uh, he was, as myself, he was very big on the second coming of the Lord. And so I, I, want, I want, listen folks, I want us to be big on the second coming of the Lord. Amen? Amen. I, when I wasn't pastoring for a while, Phyllis and I were about to join the church. And I told her, I, I don't want to join that church. The pastor was going through the Gospel of Matthew. I said, I don't want to join that church until I hear what he has to say about Matthew 24. 
So we said, and really, he didn't go through Matthew 24 like I would like for him to, but we ended up joining the church anyway. And I went to talk to him, and I told him about that. And then uh, I said, if I had to guess about you, (laughs) preachers can talk straight with each other, right? I said, if I had to guess about you, I would say that you are a millennial. A millennial means that the person does not believe that there's going to be a millennium. And usually they don't believe that there's a rapture either. They just believe that there's, makes it easy for people to talk about this, but boy, they got an awful lot of scripture to explain away. Because they think that someday that the Lord's going to come back and everybody is going to stand before him and you're either saved or lost. If you're saved, you go to heaven. If you're lost, you go to hell. That's what the amillennials believe. And they believe there's not going to be a thousand year millennial reign on earth as those of us that, uh, that are uh, premillennial do. And so, I, <laughs> but you know what he said? He said, I don't know what I believe. <laughs> what? You don't know what you believe? You've been, you've been through seminary, you're working on your doctorate degree, might have had it at the time. And you don't even know what you believe. You should have known what you believe before you ever went to seminary. (laughs) Amen? Because they sometimes try to talk you out of what you believe, as they did with me when I was in seminary. Because at the time I was in there, we had some liberals that were in control of Southern Seminary. So I'm living proof that you can still be a conservative and and graduate from a liberal seminary. Amen? (laughs) Okay. So let's get back to this now. But but what I want you all, uh, I want you to know what you believe. I want, I want to know what I believe, I, and I want all of us to really know what we believe. If somebody asks you, you, you know what you believe about this. How many people believe Jesus is coming soon? How many believe that he could appear any day in the rapture? Amen. <laughs> Amen. We're on the same page as we proceed forward. All right, let's do it. Okay, this abomination of, des- of desolation that Jesus talks about here. This word abomination is a Greek word, and it means disgust, repulsion, or hatred. That's what that word abomination means in the original language. It means pretty much the same thing in our language. <clears throat> Desolation means complete emptiness or destruction. That's what this abomination of desolation means. Now, <clears throat> here and in the Bible, it describes an event that will usher in the great tribulation. Now, remember... After the rapture of the church, the seven years tribulation will start, but the first three and a half years are not going to be as bad, not nearly as bad as the last three and a half years. The last three and a half years, the abomination of desolation takes takes, uh, place first, and then it's a terrible, terrible time. Now, Antichrist, the, the Antichrist. Now, the Apostle John, remember he said at the time he wrote... Uh, his, uh, his letters, he said, there's, there's many antichrists in the world now. Well, we'd have to say, well, there's a lot in the world in our day. There's a lot of people that are anti-Christ, anti-Christian, anti-church. Amen? But there's going to be a person, and I've had people say, well, I believe he's alive today. I, I said, you know my answer to that? He may be, I don't know. <laughs> he may be, I don't know, and I'm not going to know uh, because he's not going to be revealed until after I'm out of here anyway. How many people remember the day they used to say years ago, when I was a kid growing up, many times they said, well, the Pope is the Antichrist. You all ever hear that? I heard that when I was a kid growing up. I heard many people say the Pope is, is going to be the Antichrist. And I, and I heard a lot of people saying that's why we can't elect uh, John F. Kennedy because he's Catholic. He's going to make everybody... <laughs> that's a baloney. Amen? <laughs> that's a bunch of, uh, to borrow a, uh, a modern-day political term, that's a bunch of malarkey, right? <laughs> okay. So, but he's going to appear, and, uh, and during these three and a half years, he's going to proclaim that he's the one that's brought peace. That he's, brought, he's the one that's brought peace to this world, and uh, especially to the Middle East, and more specifically to Israel. That he's the one that brought peace. And it's, going to, it's actually going to appear to people at that time, many, many people, that he's right. That he is the all-time peacemaker. Don't you see that fitting? That some, all this came, ha, folks, listen, have you ever thought about the chaos that's going to be on planet Earth when all of us are gone? Number one, on CBS News, they're going to be trying to explain it, right? I've seen some old films, movies of this, and 
they, uh, one uh, thing that they, that some people think that might say, again, nobody knows, but some people may say, well, <clears throat> they, they, uh, there's been uh, people from another planet that have come here and carried away millions of people. <laughs> we don't know when it came, but somehow they've carried away millions of people. I can almost see them saying that, can't you? We don't know what's happened, but they're, they're all gone. Well, unfortunately, the, pe there's the people that do know what happened, it's going to be too late for them. We looked at that last time. <clears throat> okay, so he's he's claiming going to be going to be claiming that he brought he brought peace. Now, <clears throat> the uh, the abomination of desolation will bring a time that's worse than the Holocaust. Now, watch this. Daniel, the prophet Daniel, in his book with his name, uh, he used this term abom uh, abomination of desolation. He used this term three different times. He uses it in, in chapter 9, verse 27, chapter 11, verse 31, and chapter 12, verse 11. <clears throat> but now, remember, remember this. Y'all come on in and, and find your seat. We're, <laughs> we're practicing social distancing, and it looks like you can find you a seat back there pretty easily. Because <laughs> we've even got some of our people that have been coming that now, are, they're not sick from COVID, but... But they're, they're afraid that they may make somebody sick, be attested, and so forth. So anyway, we have more room this morning than normal. Good to, good to have you all. We're in Matthew chapter 24. We're looking at Matthew chapters 24 and 25 because we're trying to help all, all of our people to realize that what is going on around the world right now is an indication that the Lord is coming back soon. And it's just a precursor to all that uh, taking place. Okay, now remember, uh, in biblical prophecy, uh, often... Uh, it has a it has a present message, or I'm sorry, it has a present fulfillment and a future fulfillment. We've talked about going through this study. There's something in a in a prophecy that that people that even living in that day, something. In fact, we're going to point that out uh, that these people know about uh, one of these prophecies being fulfilled already in the book of Daniel. Okay, and so the others are going to be fulfilled. Uh, after the rapture of the church. So remember, there's a present and a future fulfillment many times in, in prophecy. Okay, and, and uh, in, this, in, this, uh, uh, in this verse, he's talking about uh, 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 in, an event that would take place uh, soon and then this other event in, in the future. Jesus is talking about this one that's going to take place in the future here. Now, watch this. D Daniel 11.31 was about that event that would, that would be instituted by Antiochus IV are also called Antiochus Epiphanes. Okay, that one has already been fulfilled. And so that was that, that, was that first, that was chapter 11, verse 31. <clears throat> now, he, who was it? He was a Syrian king uh, who ruled over Palestine from 175 to 165 uh, B.C. And I hope you all this morning, I hope I'm not just doing a history lesson. <laughs> okay, I, I want us to grasp this about what happened then, and so we'll understand that's fulfilled, and so we can understand this future prophecy is also going to be fulfilled. His name means Antioch the Great, but he began referring to himself as Theos Epiphanes, which means the magnifest God. He, re he actually referred to himself as God. He, he believed himself to be God. But now, even at that time, people referred to him as the Antioch Epimenes, which means Antioch the Mad. <laughs> Why? Because he was a madman. This Syrian king was a madman. He was crazy. He was absolute crazy. Uh, he died in 163 B.C. totally out of his mind. Totally out of his mind when he died. And is brought about in large part because of the defeat at the hands of Jewish rebels. He could not defeat him, and it drove him, it drove him mad. Let me give you a little bit of record of this Antiochus Epiphanes. History records that Antiochus, unsatisfied with his pillage and slaughter in Jerusalem, after a difficult siege, forced the Jews to dissolve their laws. He kept them from circumcising their children, making it a capital crime. Mothers caught with a circumcised child were thrown over the city walls to their deaths. Antiochus stopped the daily sacrifices 
And then he himself, listen to this, and then he himself sacrificed a pig on the altar of God. Boy, you couldn't do anything worse to a Jew, an Orthodox Jew, than to sacrifice a pig on the altar of God in, in their temple. He slaughtered both male and female Jews, looted the temple of anything of value, and ordered the compulsory Hellenization of Israel or forcing the Greek culture on them, even language. Eventually, he had the temple rededicated, listen to this, as a shrine to Zeus and replaced the, and replaced the usual sacrifices with the sacrifice of swine, forcing the Jews to eat the meat sacrificed to a pagan god. Any Jew who refused to eat pork or who was found possessing the book of the law was to be jailed or killed. And the book itself was to be burned. All synagogues and Jewish schools were closed. Those who refused to work on the Sabbath were arrested. Antiochus attempted to put an end to all visible expressions of the Jewish faith. He was out to get them. He was going to wipe them out. He sounds a lot like Adolf Hitler, doesn't he? <clears throat> okay. And watch this. There was a time it said that he went into a synagogue and began jamming pieces of pork down the throats of the Jewish rabbis until they choked to death. That's how evil and mad and crazy this man was. <clears throat> but it's amazing, yet in spite of the dreadful persecution, the people began to see themselves as a nation again. Listen, when you get God's people, when you get God's people down many times, that's when we come back. <laughs> hey, Amen? I, I think the, I, when, I, when I read this and, I, uh, uh, and see some of these things and how they actually uh, revived, I think about, again, 9-11, and it, it seemed like for a while we were experiencing some revival in our country. <clears throat> uh, I, may, I may say something about this again around the 4th of July. But after 9-11, after did you all realize that? I, I don't know how it was here. Obviously, I wasn't here back at, at that time. Uh, but in many churches around America, the churches were full. Back at that time, I was doing revivals in Los Angeles a lot. And uh, I remember in, in there, the, and the pastor telling me that, yeah, he said the churches were just, were just full after that. Well, it didn't last long, did it? And I heard a guy say something just the other day. And I thought, boy, that, that, that's, that's really true. And as much as, as all of us, listen to me closely, as much as all of us love our country and all of us would classify ourselves as patriots, amen? amen? But folks, what happened back then is that people became more patriotic for a while, but they didn't look to God for revival. And so it wasn't long until America was right back just like we were and folks, I got to tell you, I think we're worse now than what we were back then. <clears throat> well, sad. It's it's really sad. <clears throat> now, uh, this this happened. This 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 brought revival really to the Jews back at the time. It gave them a cause. Now, the Greeks were shocked. They were shocked. They thought they were going to wipe wipe these people out, but all of a sudden they see them gaining gaining strength. <clears throat> Many Jews fled to the mountains. Does that sound familiar, what we, uh, what we read? Many Jews fled uh, to the mountains. They were living in caves, and uh, many were martyred because of their faith. Antiochus Epiphanes wanted to destroy the Jews, but it backfired. <laughs> it backfired on him. They, get, they just got, they got stronger. I hope, I got to say this too. I, I thought about something. You remember the fir our first Sunday back together, that I mentioned, and of course, it's been said by a lot of people, including our president, that we are <clears throat> that we're battling an invisible enemy. But I've given that some thought lately, and folks, I really don't think that that's necessarily or completely true. I think the enemy is communist China. I really do. I don't know how this virus got started over there, whether it was intentional or not. But it just happens, there's, there's so much that went on there. And uh, when they had the virus there, they hid it, did not let it out. And uh, 
they, they shut down travel within their own country from Wuhan to other places, but they let people from Wuhan go all over the world. And they began to buy up all this protective equipment that they could at that time. So knowing all that, I have a hard time believing it was just an accident. But here's what I believe. I believe the enemy in this is China, but I believe their weapon of war is what's invisible. That's what I believe, folks. And uh, I would have a hard, if you want to try to, to you know, to say, uh, debate me on that, I'm open. <laughs> I'm open to it. That's just, what I, that's just what I believe right now. Well, there's another guy that came along to lead this bunch of people. Now, his name was uh, Judas Maccabeus. It's also called uh, uh, Judah or Judas Maccabee. Uh, but he was a Jewish zealot that wasn't about to sit by and let his country be destroyed by this wicked, evil man like it was happening. So he put together a little army that lived off the land. He reminded, when I, when I read about him, he reminds me, I don't know how many, how many people watch Mountain Men on TV. Anybody watch Mountain Men? That's, Phyllis and I, we watch that every night. <laughs> we know all the guys, you know, all the guys on there. And I guarantee you one guy I would not want to go to his house is Eustace. He eats roadkill. <laughs> don't want to go to Eustace's house. But anyway, those guys are living off the land. I thought about before, my, even myself, I used to think about this years ago. I'm way past it now. But I thought, I thought about years ago, it would be kind of cool, wouldn't it? To just to live out, and, and, and some of you ladies are already shaking your heads no, but just to live out and basically depend on, on what you get off the land, you know, to, to, be, able to, to be able to get by. Uh, I, I had an uncle one time. He said, I wish we lived 30 miles from the store. He said, uh, so we couldn't go to the store every day. And he, he's, I was, I'm a lot like him. He'd rather just go by horseback anyway. <laughs> but these, these people were like that. They were, these, these rebels were living off the land. They, they, they uh, would hide in the mountains. <clears throat> and, and every once in a while, they would, they would come upon a town. They would attack a town, and they'd, they'd pull down the pagan altars circumcise the children and kill any Jews that were, that were supporting Antioch Epiphanes. So these zealots. <clears throat> now, Antioch Epiphanes, he sent uh, his armies to destroy that bunch of guerrillas. He, he sent them, he sent them the, the first time, he sent a pretty good sized army, and boy, they were well equipped. And as far as that day, they, they were modern for that day. And the first time he sent them, they got whipped. <laughs> that band of gorillas whipped them. And he couldn't, he couldn't stand that, so he, he sent the armies uh, the second time, and they were also uh, not successful. And even at that time, uh, that's the time that the, that the gorilla group behind Judas Maccabeus uh, captured Jerusalem. They captured Jerusalem, removed all the pagan idols, cleansed and rededicated the temple, Restored the Jewish Orthodox faith again. <clears throat> that event, are you listening? Say, I am. I am. Okay, that event is why the Jews today celebrate Hanukkah. That's Hanukkah to the Jews. That's why they celebrate Hanukkah, because they celebrate the reinstatement of their religion under Judas Maccabeus. <clears throat> so that's, that's the story of the abomination of, of desolation as far as the first time it was uh, uh, showed up in prophecy. That's, 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 that's happened already. We know we look back at history, and, and some of you all know history a whole lot better than I do. You look, you look back at history and you say, well, that prophecy has been fulfilled. <clears throat> and, and by the way, there are some liberal Bible scholars today that try to even tie in others to that and say that's why this Antichrist stuff, that's nothing, that's already been fulfilled. Now, there's, there's one difference in it, too, that happened back then, Antioch Epiphanes. Uh, he set up statues in the temple, took away the sacrifice, set up statues. The Antichrist is going to set up himself. Himself. He is the one that's going to go in the temple. <clears throat> and he'll, he's going to want people to worship him. <clears throat> now, this is, this is talked about in Daniel 9, 27, and, and uh, chapter 12, verse 11. And I think it's 12, 11, where they talk, talks about uh, the number of, uh, of days, uh, which really, uh, in that prophecy, when he talks about uh, a week, that's seven years, okay? And then so it's in the middle of that seven years, that's when the abomination uh, of desolation is going to take place. That's when this Antichrist is going to take, take up his throne. 
uh, I just want to show you what the New Testament says about him here in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul writes, and he says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. That's talking about uh, the Antichrist. And I want to say a couple things about this, this falling away first. Uh, because there's, there's two different schools uh, of thought here. One school of thought is there's going to be apostasy uh, uh, just before the, the Lord comes back. Uh, and then uh, it means the falling, falling away. But others believe that word falling, that word falling away, if you change one letter, it becomes calling away, which is the rapture. <laughs> okay? And so whichever view you take... His, his being revealed, Antichrist being revealed, is going to be after the rapture. And this is what he said. Look, watch what he says in verse 4. Talking about the Antichrist, he says, Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And, of course, the Apostle Paul reminds them he told them these things even when he was there with them. <clears throat> So, there is the Antichrist. That, that, other, that other prophecy is going to be fulfilled uh, in the Antichrist. The abomination of desolation is after that three and a half years, he breaks a treaty with Israel, and he sets himself up to, uh, in the temple, does away with their, temp, uh, with their sacrifices, sets himself up, and now he's going to say, I'm God. You need to worship me. And there's many people that's going to lose their lives uh, during that period of time uh, because he's, he and, and his evil... Uh, ones that follow him are going to try to force people into taking the mark of the beast, and, uh, and many people are going to die. Remember, some people are going to be saved. We talked about that last week. The 144,000 uh, <clears throat> Jewish evangelists that are going to travel throughout the world preaching the gospel, they're going to have the gift of tongues. They're going to be able to speak in every language, and so they can share the gospel with people. One thing that I failed to mention last Sunday, I think, of how some people take that 144,000 out of context, some have even started denominations with that 144,000. <laughs> but they've had to change their Bibles because uh, uh, they didn't know what they're going to do with the leftovers. <laughs> so they had, to, they had to change some things. But the 144,000 is 144,000 Jewish evangelists that are going to have a seal on them. They're going to be scattered throughout the world preaching the gospel to people that have never heard. And those people will have the chance to receive Christ as their personal Savior and be saved. Now, I want to focus just for a minute, and we're going to close. <clears throat> on uh, the temple, the new temple. Because some people say, well, how, how can this be, this, the temple? Uh, the Babylonians destroyed the temple over 2,500 years ago, first time. Uh, and after it was rebuilt, it was destroyed by Rome. And today, what's there today? Somebody tell me. The Dome of the Rock. The Muslims have the Dome of the Rock. They have their mosque set up there today. Same place where the temple is supposed to be rebuilt. And the Muslims, they believe Muhammad ascended to heaven from there in the early 7th century. And so you think, well, how... Wait a minute, Brother Dottie. <laughs> how, how can this be? There's going to be a, there's going to be a new temple. That rascal's going to have to be built pretty quick, isn't it? Yeah, about three years. Three to three and a half years, that new temple is going to be built on that same place. Now, we know how God took care of the Jews throughout their history, right? A lot of bad things happened to them, of course. And we talked about some of them this morning. But we remember the great miracles, don't we? All the plagues in Egypt, God delivered them from Egypt. Got them out of the Red Sea. Waters parted, they went across on dry ground. Came to the Jordan River, right at the end of the Promised Land. Rivered right up, they went over, across that, across that river. He's done some, and then Jesus, when he came, he did all kinds of great miracles. Amen? So, would you, would you say that God is the God of miracles? Huh? He is, isn't he? He's still performing, performing miracles even today. Now, think about this. During that period of time, after the rapture, and here's this, the start of the tribulation period, there's going to be war. Remember the wars and rumors of wars, all this going on. Is it too big of a thing? We, just, we even just talked about 
Judas Maccabeus and his little band of guerrillas <laughs> and how they defeated big armies. Was that a miracle? Who did it? God did it through him, right? He did not want that nation to be destroyed. He's protecting folks through the years. Is it too big a thing for God in the, with the modern technology that we have today in our world today that some Jews can't use that technology? Come on now, right? Can't, that, they can use that technology plus a miracle of God and get that temple built. Huh? Don't you think that can be done? I, 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 I want up you. It will be done. <laughs> it will be done. How do you know? Because God said it would. That's enough for me. People say, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. I, I'm here to tell you this. God said it. doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. If he said it, it's settled. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And so he's, he's coming. He's coming. He's, he's coming soon. This stuff of going on, folks, I, uh, I was going to, we were going to play uh, song Phyllis and I looked at last night, one of my, my, one of my favorite songs, because you hear a lot, sheltering in place. Are you sick of sheltering in place? <laughs> Aren't you get, are at least getting sick of sheltering in place? Well, the, the title of one of my favorite songs is Sheltered in the Arms of God. Amen? We are sheltered in His arms. He knows what's going on. He loves us. And I believe someday and someday soon, the trumpet's going to sound. There's a lady asked me the other day, said, now what direction is it, is it coming from? Is it coming from that direction? I said, ma'am, I don't know my directions here. <laughs> he's, he's coming out of the east. I said, I don't know if that's east or not. I don't know. I, you know, I get turned around. I get out of my backyard. I'm turned around. <laughs> I'm not quite as bad as one preacher I heard about Joel Gregory many years ago. He pastored First Baptist Dallas for a while. <clears throat> and they said, Joel was a great preacher, but they said he... Besides preaching, he couldn't even get to the pulpit. <laughs> Since you had to lead him to the pulpit, he, he didn't have any sense of directions any better than that. Leading the pulpit, he's a dynamic preacher. I think about Jim, Mc, Jim McNeil could get lost on a dime. Jim, you all remember Jim McNeil, Evangelist Jim McNeil that was, that was with us. I'd go to Southern Baptist conventions with him, and, and uh, we'd get off the interstate, and there's so many times he turned the wrong way getting back on. <laughs> he, he's... He, and Phyllis, sometimes she's with me uh, in visiting hospitals, and invariably she gets off the elevator and turns the wrong way, right? <laughs> well, God has got his sense of direction, amen? He knows what's going to happen. He knows, folks, listen, it's his plan. You think this coronavirus surprised God? It didn't surprise God. He knew it was going to happen. Can he use it? He is using it. Many people are coming to faith. And, and all of us are going to have opportunity after opportunity to tell other people you need to... You think this is something? Oh, listen. When the rapture takes place, if you're left behind, it's going to be a whole lot worse than this. This won't be anything compared to what people are going to go through after the rapture of the church. Now, I want you all to stand with me, please. <clears throat> and we're not... As you all know, this is our third week being back and... and uh, we haven't been able to give our, our uh, normal, uh, traditional invitations. Uh, but I want you, everyone to bow their head, close their eyes for just a moment. And I'm going to ask you a few questions this morning, and uh, we're going to close uh, in prayer. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you, first of all, if you do believe that Jesus is coming soon, then just lift your hand. You believe that the Lord is coming back soon. Now let me ask you this question. Do you have some loved ones that would be left behind if he came back today? Lift your hand. Amen. Now let me ask you this question. Are you, are you ready? If he comes back today, are you ready? Do you know in your heart of hearts that you've, asked Je that you've accepted Jesus as your personal Savior? And he says in his word, if you have him, you have life. If you do not have him, you do not have life. So you know today you have life because you've asked Jesus to come into your heart. Would you just lift your hand? You just lift it up and right back down. Amen. 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 <clears throat> now let me let me do this and we're gonna we're gonna dismiss. If you haven't, if you don't have that assurance in your heart, I'm gonna I'm just gonna pray a simple prayer. And if you'll pray it in your heart, you don't have to pray it out loud, but pray it in your heart. And uh you can invite Jesus to come into your heart. I'm going to guide you into prayer. 
but it's not it's it's your it's your message to the Lord that this is what you're saying to him. I just want to guide you in this. And I want to encourage you to do this. If you do pray that prayer and ask the Lord to come in into your heart. He says in his word, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so if you'll call upon him, believe that he died for your sins, you can be saved. But I ask you to do this. If you do that, when you go out, the bulletins, there's, if you didn't, anybody, if anybody here didn't get a bulletin, there's bulletins on the back table back there. Just take a moment, tear that flap off, and write down your name. And there's a place on there I think you can check uh, that, that you've asked the Lord to come into your heart. So you can do that. Now, let me ask everybody else to lift uplifted hand. Do, would you like to see a revival in America? Amen. 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 Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, in Jesus' name, once again, as we have met together and as we've looked at the Olivet Discourse that Jesus taught so many years ago that's so alive today, we know that all the, uh, the uh, famine, the pestilence, the earthquakes, the wars and rumors of wars that we've already read in that chapter, Lord, we see these things happening. And we know that this is a precursor, Lord, just letting us know that these things can and will happen. And so, Lord, we see this and we see what's going on uh, in our world right now. This pandemic, Lord, this slipped up on us. We had no idea, but it's here. And, Lord, we're trying to get through this, but we understand also that you've done this for a purpose. And, uh, Lord, we pray that you'll use us uh, as individuals and as a church uh, for your purpose in, in reaching people with the gospel of Jesus. And Father, I pray if there's anyone here today, Lord, that has never asked you to come into uh, his or her life, that they would just simply pray this prayer and knowing that if they'll pray this and mean it, Lord, that you'll answer this prayer. So if you need to pray that prayer this morning, just pray after me quietly in your heart. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that I've sinned against you. And I'm sorry for my sins. I believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for my sins. I believe that he rose from the dead and he's alive today. So right here, right now today, I want to ask you, Lord. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and forgive me of my sins. And Lord, I promise that I'm going to live for you forever. Help me to tell somebody soon that I've just prayed that prayer and I know I'm saved. Lord, we know that when persons pray that prayer, the rapture take place, Lord, they're ready to meet you face to face. So we thank you for that. Now, Lord, we pray that you'll dismiss us with your love and Lord, we pray that you'll give each one a safe trip home and Lord, we look forward to being uh, together again next Sunday. Lord, we pray again uh, for these that we mentioned this morning for, for our special prayer. Uh, Lord, that your will would be done in each life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.